my doll faces ages ago, like I think the beginning of last month potentially. No, it was in June. It was in June. In June I asked for some questions for a couple of Q&A videos and I did get a lot of questions and I had a free afternoon that I was planning to just sit down and film these Q&A videos and then the free afternoon went the way of the dodo and then the questions got a little bit out of hand so then I just waited and waited and basically what I'm trying to say is I procrastinated but now I'm giving you the Q&A that I should have given you over a month ago so I'm gonna start with the Facebook questions and just see how far I get can I raid your closet no 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 <laughs> i'm very particular about that actually to be honest with you like i don't mind people borrowing my clothes occasionally but they need to let me know and they need to like wash it and get it back to me ironed and in perfect standard like immediately after they've used it i'm really like i can be quite anal about my clothes in a sense because i just like to know where things are because i like to have the choice um so i like to know what's available to me i picked this very snazzy Ted Baker shirt up from a charity shop last week for like no money and it's got I think they're are they French pit bulls oh and some of them have got um bow ties on are they French pit bulls I don't know look at your little doggy oh the beautiful doggy how hip am I that's the question mm. pretty hip I would love to know which artists of whichever genre inspire you and if there is any music you listen to in preparation for your readings. Um, in preparation for readings, well, I don't normally listen to music in preparation, but I do sometimes listen to music while I'm doing readings. However, it has to be music without lyrics. So it's going to be like drum and bass or post rock or classical, all three of which I quite like to, uh, to use to get me in the zone. Um, I suppose drum and bass I use more in preparation for readings, as in I quite like to listen to drum and bass um, before I start the day sometimes, like before I get into that initial reading so that it kind of makes me feel really fueled and ready to, ready to do this, ready to do this thing. So many artists um, inspire me so much in all different mediums, in all different ways, it would be really difficult to, um, to know where the fuck to start. Um, it's writers mainly who influence me and inspire me. Um, yeah, just I love the beat poets. I love, I love certain female poets that I've just been in love with for years. Um, it's just so hard to know where to start. I don't really want to pull a name out of the bag. I'm endlessly inspired by creative people. Endlessly inspired by creative people, and I love discovering new creative people. What methods do you personally employ to raise energy for magical workings? That's a great question. Um, I've used a lot of different things over the years, but what really, really does it for me nowadays is chanting. Chanting mantras, chanting ancient um, words, uh, and just doing that over and over and over again. That, that just really takes me to another place. I love to use um, Ong Namo Guru Dev Namo, and I like to use Ra Ma Da Sa Sa Se So Han. It's just, it just kills me, it, dry, it just, it kills me and it births me again. If you can chant enough, you can absolutely go to another place. Do it, do it now. You're such an inspiration for so many wonder workers, tarot card slingers and magic makers. Who inspires you when it comes to your magical practices? Oh, Matt. <laughs> oh God, I've gone all red. <laughs> uh, Matt from Ashes and Wine. Isn't he a legend? Um, thank you so much. That's lovely. That's really lovely. I'm a bumbling fool. Um, my boyfriend calls me a panda with a haircut. A posh panda with a haircut is what he calls me. So really, it's just like, it's all smoke and mirrors. I'm actually just a bumbling idiot. Um, but yeah, thank you. Anyway, that's lovely of you. Um, so many people inspire me when it comes to mystical practices. Oh, sorry, he said mystical practices, not magical practices. Um, so many people inspire me, so many authors inspire me, um, but really, you know, what I'm, what I'm inspired by a great deal of the time is people talking about the nuts and bolts of their spiritual practice and then putting it on YouTube or putting it on a blog and just being really open about it and honest about it. I have gleaned so much inspiration from being on YouTube. I have gleaned so much inspiration from reading blogs about paganism, witchcraft and spirituality. Um, because it really, I really just feel like there's something about the internet that really kills the hierarchy aspect, doesn't it? Like in the in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you could go and listen to somebody speak, but 
other than that, it was really books. It was really that kind of, you know, the, the amount of people that could get through the eye of a needle that would actually get published by a mainstream publication, like a mainstream, um, what the hell am I trying to say, publishing house. Whereas now I feel like it's all really levelled. We've levelled the hierarchy. It's a level playing field. We can all express our experiences. We can all talk about spirituality and what it means to us. And I love to just wade endlessly in the fruit of, of the online orchard. You know, there's just something so inspiring about watching a mother of two with her kids kind of playing next to her and she's talking about her experiences with Isis and how it's helping her to become a better mother. Um, and she's talking in the moment, you know, she's not got a lot of notes or she's not reading from an auto cue or there's something so bloody earthy so earthy about that and that's what I love to have access to that's what I really love and that's what really inspires me I'm listening to your SoundCloud I'm blown away so much information how do you speak so eloquently for 45 minutes thank you a million times I kind of addressed this in my last Q&A um, I am born of two families that are very keen on gas bagging really just love to talk um, one side of the family are big debaters um, very much intellectuals, um, just love the thrill of the art of conversation. The other side of the family loves to gossip, loves to tell raucous jokes, loves to kind of like one up each other with the witticisms and like the cheekiness, you know? So I come from two long lines of, um, you know, of people and bloodlines that, you know, are very kind of like into poetry and the oral tradition and talking, gas bagging, debating, going at it. like. So I think that's definitely a part of it. Um, I also love language. I'm fascinated by language. I've been fascinated by language since I was very small. Um, I love talking. It comes really naturally to me. I don't know if that's going to shock any of you because, um, you know, obviously it's it's not something that I make obvious in my videos, but I love to talk. Um, it, I delight in it. It's a passion. So basically what I would say about talking is it comes effortlessly to me. It's one of those things that just comes effortlessly to me. Maths. I'm useless, I'm useless. I don't know my nine times tables, but I can I can talk, I love to talk. Your favorite fiction authors, either magically inspired or not, and favorite beauty routine makeup products. You always look so lovely and unique. Thank you, Jessica, I love you. Um, favorite fiction authors, I do not really read a lot of fiction, um, but the fiction authors that I like off the top of my head, I love Bukowski, I love Hemingway, I love William Burroughs, I love uh, Milan Kundera, I love, uh, who else do I love? Oh, I love F. Scott Fitzgerald, Flannery O'Connor, Truman Capote, Anthony Burgess, George Orwell. I love George Orwell's essays as well, by the way. Irvin Welsh. <laughs> Irvin Welsh is like a modern classic god, demigod, author, man. I love Anne Enright. Anne Enright writes fucking beautiful fiction. Well, but by the, do you know what? <laughs> when I read a novel of hers or some short stories of hers, afterwards I think to myself, I genuinely get this feeling of awe where I think, why does anyone else bother? Just leave it to her. She's the only one that need apply. And I kind of laugh as I consider burning everything I've ever done. Like, it's just so awesome. She's awesome. I love her. As you can tell, I'm into classic fiction more. I don't go into the bookshop and pick up bestsellers or look at who's writing what now. Um, if I feel that I have time to read fiction, then it's going to be um, what you would consider to be classic fiction. But I, I don't really like that term um, because the canon is kind of questionable. Questionably, um, questionably like devoid of people of colour and women. Um, but yeah, essentially, like I love, I love classic fiction like I've read all the Bronte sisters books and you know I really I put time into that I love D.H. Lawrence I just it, classics classics I love them my favorite beauty routine slash makeup products mostly come from Lush I love Lush um, I'm really a big fan of Lush I also love Urban Decay and Barry M for makeup um, but Lush products more for um, kind of the beauty regime I use Ultra Balm to um, sort out tough bits of skin like around my fingers and on my hands and stuff. I like to use um, Karma cream lotion from Lush. I use the Enchanted Eye Cream from Lush. I use, what else do I use? I use their lip tints. I use their bath products, their bath bombs. I use their Rose Argan body conditioner, which is the Shizzle McNizzle. 
it's all cruel, cruelty free and organic and low carbon footprint -y as heck. So yeah, check out Lush, absolutely amazing, I love their stuff. Pretty much all of my eye makeup is Urban Decay and all of my nail varnish is Barry M. I don't really have a routine, I usually just do something with my face every day. Sometimes it'll occur to me that I want to moisturise it, uh, sometimes I want to give it a really good scrub with an exfoliating scrub with like lemon, eucalyptus and tea tree in it, things like that. Again, Lush, they're my go-to people. What is the one thing you want most in the world and for the world? How has your work changed your world? I'm not sure I could like narrow it down to one thing that I want most in the world, but I am personally very passionate about and very switched on by emotional intelligence and the idea of plumbing the depths of the psyche for knowledge of ourselves and each other and of human uh, beings as a species. Um, Connie Zweig once said that she felt that Carl Gustav Jung should have won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work on the idea of the shadow, the shadow aspect. And um, and I, I really feel more and more as I get older that, that that's true. I really feel like it's the way, it's the way for us to stop persecuting each other, stop projecting onto each other, stop massacring each other, stop hating on each other. So that's really important to me. And how has my work changed my world? Um, in just about every conceivable way. It's made me more empathetic. It's helped me to unleash my creativity where before it was all stuck up inside a little box and it, it had resistance all over it. You know, I used to write a lot more fiction and a lot more poetry, but there was so much resistance. It wasn't easy. It didn't flow. I was so hung up and I was so obsessed with like being good enough. And what I've realised is that you've got to find the flow, you've got to find what comes to you effortlessly, and that's where the joy is. I love writing poetry, but I want to write it when it comes to me in the moment. I don't want to write it because I'm pushing myself to write it, because I'm forcing myself to have that experience or be that thing. When I write self-development or I talk about spirituality or I put... Um, you know, products together or items together that are to do with um, flourishing and dropping into your heart and connecting with your sense of what's possible. That comes easy for me, that flows effortlessly. So I suppose what I've learned through doing the work that I do in the world is I've learned that what comes easy and what is a little effort is so wondrous and so majestic. Danielle Laporte said that when it's easy for you, you can be of greater service to everyone around you. I love, I love, oh my God, I'm getting emotional. Ah! I love that, I love that. When it's easy for you, you can be of greater service to everyone around you. What a fucking revelationary idea. Um, and that I get, I could talk all night about my, what my work has given to me. It's, it's, it's given me a lot, it's amazing. And I have given a lot to it. I am currently sitting in a hotel room right now because I needed to get away from the hustle and bustle of my house so I could, you know, work on the final things for Self Love September and blog and, you know, make sure the sound, the SoundCloud sessions are great. And, you know, so I invest into it too. I give back to it too. It is something that I'm sincerely passionate about. This is not part time. This is not something that I come and go to. This is not something that I, you know, um, I kind of commit to and then fall away from. This is everything to me. You know, I love it. I'm dying to know what kind of camera you use for your videos. I'm in the market for one. I use Lumix. Um, I actually um, can't remember the model offhand, but I know that it is, you can't buy it new anymore. Let me just have a look. It's a DMC ZS3, apparently. And uh, I went on a very long search to try and find a camera, um, like a little handheld sort of, in your bag type camera which would take high quality videos that wouldn't stop after a certain length of time because quite a lot of these handheld majiggers that you're supposed to use as cameras you can make videos with them but the videos only last for 15 minutes or 20 minutes which as you will know um, doesn't work for me it won't wash for me I'm incredibly verbose and I like to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on so I found a model that was perfect for making videos. Not that there aren't probably other models of Lumix that are great for making videos, but none that I could really find that had the other features that I wanted, so that's what I use. Forgive me if this is too personal. I know that you use the Leonie Dawson workbook. I was wondering what your word of the year is. I think the word of the year is so interesting. I agree, I think it's really interesting too. My word of the year is abundance, and I kind of meant that on just about every level that you could imagine that it could be meant. And so far, so good. You know, I feel very abundant. Everything is feeling abundant and gorgeous and flourishing and so much, so much, so much majesty, so much opportunity. So yeah, abundance was the word I chose and it came very naturally to me. But you know what, I think I've, I've decided already 
that next year my word is going to be something really Hierophant-esque. I'm feeling that, I don't know what my year card is, what my tarot card year card is next year, I haven't worked it out yet. Um, but I I feel like it's going to be a hierophant -y kind of year, whatever the weather. So I think it's going to be something like discipline or commitment or focus or something next year. I've got this feeling, I've got this feeling in my bones. Do you prefer oracle cards or tarot cards? Like, I prefer tarot in the sense that tarot is the structure, tarot is the formula, tarot is the prime mover, and everything else comes from that kind of thing. Like, you know, so many decks of oracle cards take their inspirations from tarot. And even just the idea of what you do with oracle cards and how you use them is inspired by tarot. So, you know, it's tarot, I guess, from, you know, if I had to, like, throw oracle cards on the pyre or throw tarot cards on the fire, I know I'd definitely choose to just get rid of all the oracle cards. Um, we could start again, do you know what I mean? But tarot is kind of forms the basis and the firm foundation. I'm incredibly passionate about the system, but I do love oracle cards and there is a huge place in my heart for them. If you had the chance to travel back in time, would you do a reading for Arthur Waite or Jung? Jung. Jung, 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 Jung. I would do a reading for Jung. I would take tea with Jung. That would be the, the best day ever. Oh my God. <laughs> Jung's turned up in my dreams before, hopefully he'll turn up in a dream again soon as a result of answering that question, because it's like brought it into my consciousness. Do you use more than one tarot deck for the same question, for same question reading? Oh right, okay, like do you use a different deck for advice cards or even using oracle for advice cards etc? I've done that before and I definitely think you can do it. I have this spread called a life map spread where I actually sometimes like to use one set of three cards from one deck, one from one and one from another. Because the life map um, spread that I've designed works in three parts. So I do childhood to adolescence, adolescence through to early adulthood, mid adulthood, and then mid adulthood to now, or however old the client is, I kind of mix it up. So I quite like to sometimes select three decks, um, three different decks, depending upon what I'm intuitively drawn to. So I have done that before, and I definitely think that you can do that. I think that's a really um, inspired idea. I don't do it very often though. I only do it for like set spreads, um, and it's certainly not something that I do regularly. Um, I more do it for myself, I suppose, than anything, or I do it in ritual or in spellcraft rather than for clients. For clients, I like to stick to the one deck for the main. If you had to live in another period of history or prehistory, where would you go? I would love to journey with the first band of humans that travelled up the Nile. That's a really, really good idea. Um, if I had to live in another period of history or prehistory, I would probably go to Iceland at the time that the Icelandic sagas was being written when a lot of Norse people were travelling around that area, going across the freezing seas and like greeting each other and exchanging and trading with each other and a lot of cultural exchange was happening and it was all very kind of uh, delicious and flourishing and rich and lovely and there were stories by the fireside and people recording this stuff for posterity. I would definitely love to go to that part of history. Sometimes I feel like I'd like to go to um, difficult and violent parts of history and experience them through a pane of glass, just so I could experience the full magnitude and the full horror and the full um, expression of what human beings are capable of. I've often thought about going back to um, segregation in America and the time of lynchings or going back to certain violent revolutions that have taken place. Um, so that's something that I often think about, and maybe that's just the darker part of my character. Like imagining kind of shadowing a guard at Auschwitz or something, you know, just just drinking it in and being like, fuck. Was your identification with being a witch something that felt more inherent, or did your personal practice help shape your identity? Essentially, do you feel it was nature or nurture? I've actually gone on and spoken about this in my Owning the Word video, that I do feel like some of the stuff that I've done that's inherent to my practice as a witch is stuff that I did as a child and was inherent to my existence as a child. It was inherent to my identity as a child. So there's massive amounts of overlap. Um, and I certainly connected with the word very young, very young. I was certainly doing like trance work very young. I was scrying really young. I was fascinated by anything even remotely occult. And I definitely felt the energies of, of stuff and whatnot. So yeah, you know, I guess I don't necessarily feel that it was nature per se, but I feel like the nature of the witch and the nature of the child have a lot of overlap, you know. 
I would love to hear about the humble beginnings of the Four Queens and how your ideas came to life. Maybe you answered that, but I missed it. Or what do you feel is the best way to share yourself and your small heart-centred business on social media? The Four Queens started as a tarot blog, and the tagline for the tarot blog was Tarot for the Chic Enthusiast. I wanted to kind of combine high fashion imagery um, with tarot, so that was my idea. And this was long before I realised that you couldn't just take photos from the internet and put them on your blog. Um, this was like 2011, so I wasn't really au fait with like copyright and things of that nature at the time. Um, so yeah, I wanted to really combine high fashion imagery and high fashion um, like aesthetics with tarot and then write about tarot from very much my own perspective, like taking things from my own angle. So that was how it started. Um, and then I began a Facebook page where I started to offer free readings. I gave it the same name. Uh, whenever I blogged, I referred people to the blog to show people what I could do and what I was all about. And then after I'd given quite a lot of free readings, I opened up an Etsy shop. So it was about, I think it was between six and eight months after I started giving free readings. And bear in mind, I was also giving some free readings on other pages on Facebook that offer free tarot readings. You could volunteer to be a reader there. So I was doing free readings there as well. And once I felt like I'd gotten the hang of it and you know I had some people returning for free readings, then I set up an Etsy shop. And I think you know I charged such a tiny amount in the beginning and such a tiny word count. So it would have been like three pound 50 for 250 words or something like that and then I got like more ambitious quite quickly um, I just wanted to dip my toe in the water so that's how that started the best way to share your business and your self on social media is to be authentic and to enjoy the process um, just be yourself and enjoy it if you're not enjoying it if you're only doing it to gain an audience or to kind of grow your business but you're really having no fun then the likelihood is that the fact that you're having no fun is going to translate into you not being able to grow your business and, and gain an audience so it's really important to be having fun first and foremost and to learn what that means and what that looks like for you on social media you know because it is different for everybody um, go over onto SoundCloud, the links are in the doobly-doo as always, check out my Wonderworker Biz Riffs, there are two at the moment, I'm developing a third and I'm going to go on in that vein and kind of talk to people more about, um, about business advice and my kind of ideas on that. Um, and I'm kind of I'm putting everything under the header of Wonder Worker and also look out for my blog and SoundCloud in the month of November because Global Entrepreneurship Week is coming and I'm going to be creating some content for owners of small businesses, heart-centred, spirit-led small businesses then so there'll be more from me on this. You are very well spoken in your videos and I really appreciate the fact that you don't say um constantly, lol. Thank you very much. I do, I do say it though. I say it mostly with like Q&A videos and stuff that I haven't planned, to be honest. Stuff that I haven't really even thought about what I want to say, so I'm there like, um... But yeah, it doesn't really, it doesn't happen much, I guess. I'm not really ever lost for words. Who is your most favourite author of all time? I definitely couldn't choose, but if you refer back to the fiction authors that I mentioned earlier in the video, they'll definitely give you an impression of what I like to read in terms of fiction. I have favourite historians and I have favourite spiritual writers. You know, but I have those people that I come back to time and time again, like Alan Watts and, you know, um, and Jung, um, Robert A. Johnson, who's a Jungian analyst, just stuff that I return to that I can really drink from. And obviously, like, you've got authors like Jan Fries, uh, Peter J. Carroll, um, Phil Hine, people that write about magic from the perspective that I'm really interested in, too. Besides tarot, what's another passion of yours? Getting dressed, style personal style, learning about other people's style and why they, they wear what they do, learning about ethical fashion, eco fashion, sustainable fashion, upcycling, um, just stuff like that really. I think if I wasn't doing what I am doing now, I would definitely be a style writer or a blogger of some kind writing about sustainable fashion and um, creativity with regard to what you put on your back. Do you do rituals before readings? No, not really. I just sit with the question. I might make some notes. If the notes that the client has given me are particularly in-depth, I might make some notes just to consider what it is that I want to um, do in terms of the spread and in terms of like what's important to focus on for the client. Um, I select some crystals and sometimes also some incense and I do let my clients know um, which additional tools I have used and why I've used them so that I can set the mood and occasionally I also select some music. It depends how I'm feeling.
I feel like my morning spiritual routine, the altar work that I do and that kind of stuff, that really sets me up for doing client readings. I don't really necessarily feel it's important to have a ritual before every individual reading, although of course I do go through my little deck shuffle. That's definitely a ritual that no reader could be without. What are your thoughts about coming out of the broom closet? I talk about this in my video um, about spiritual musings, spiritual thoughts, spiritual musings, tales from my spiritual journey. I don't know. I'm drinking beer. That's all I remember about it. I'll link it in the doobly do with the approximate time that I start talking about my experience of coming out of the broom closet. I also have a video about the broom closet, which I'll also link below in the doobly 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 do. Besides from oracle or tarot divination system, is there any other divination system that you may want to sink your teeth into? I read runes and I use them to connect with my matron deity. Um, so I do I do read runes and I have offered rude re rune readings. Rude readings? Sounds cheeky. Um, no, I haven't offered rude readings. I've offered rune readings before on my shop, um, but I don't offer them currently. I have a set of runes that I only use for time in sacred space to connect with my dark mother. Um, and so, yeah, that's a really important divination system to me, I suppose, for obvious reasons. She's the goddess of the, um, the Norse underworld yada yada. Um, I like scrying and I feel that I am reasonably accomplished at scrying, reasonably good at scrying, so that's something that um, that I really like. I'd like to check out the Lenormand system. I don't really, um, I haven't really explored it so far because it's not really cool to me, but it's definitely something that I think I should know about, um, I should learn a little bit about, and um, I'd be interested in learning more at some point about I Ching just because it was so fascinating to Jung. Um, I read the book of I Ching quite often and I love the little bits of advice and stuff but I'd like to learn how to actually use the coins. Oh and I want a crystal ball, I'm in the market for a crystal ball, I really really want to try and scry using a crystal ball, that, that to me is so exciting so that's definitely one thing that I'm planning to purchase hopefully before the year is out, um, although I, I've, I kind of, I've reached my maximum for my budget for like witchy stuff for the year really but I would love a crystal ball, I'm not gonna lie. Next question from this person literally is what are your thoughts on the Lenormand divination system? There you go. My thoughts are I'd like to learn a little more. But it's I'm not drawn to it, you know, let me just say that. Let me be honest about that. I don't feel drawn to it. So that's why I haven't worked with it because it hasn't called to me yet. But I want to get a Lenormand reading. I'm in the market for a Lenormand reading and I already know the reader that I want. So I'm interested in getting a reading first and then maybe seeing if I branch out from that point into being interested in learning. As an aspiring card reader, I sometimes face a hiccup or a weird uh, card during a reading. What I mean to say is the card doesn't make sense or it's hard to read. It doesn't have the flowing energy with the other cards or it doesn't fit in with the other cards. What is your thoughts, opinion or advice on this situation? Um, my advice would be in a nutshell that that card is valuable for that reason. If it's jarring to you, if it doesn't seem to fit in with what the other cards are saying, then it's valuable for that reason. It probably contains something that is going to be very meaty for you and very meaty for the client or querent. So it's definitely worth paying attention to and it's definitely something that I would say it's significant precisely because it feels a little bit out of place, you know. If you're reading for a client like face to face or on Skype or a querent, face to face or on Skype and you come across a card that you're really not sure about, don't forget that you can go out of sequence, hit the other cards first and kind of allow yourself to make a story out of them and see what they reveal to you in the moment as you're talking about them and then come back to the card that you're having issues with and you might find there's a lot of clarity around the card after you've absorbed the messages of the other cards. There are still so many questions on Facebook and there are still quite a few questions over on Twitter that I haven't even hit yet. Uh, I'm going to come back and do another Q&A at another time. It might potentially be in October now, but I hope you enjoyed this and I hope that it allowed you to learn a little bit more about me. And if you have any questions for me, do leave them down below and I'll try and include them and I'll maybe make the Q&A into more of an ongoing thing. Um, so yeah, very much love. Blessed be.